Okay, so then we'll go ahead and call the select board meeting for Wednesday, October 13th, 2021 to order. It's also a uh, posted public forum for the special town meeting and also a posted finance committee meeting as well. So we're gonna roll right into um, the public forum and uh, Carolyn or Randy, do you wanna give a quick intro to when town meeting is? And uh, um, Carolyn, do you wanna kinda hit the yeah, I, as well? Sure. Sure, I can do that. So the special town meeting is October 16th outside at the public safety complex. Right now, my app says it's a 60% chance of rain, um, but we are looking at trying to get some additional covering. I, I think we'll be fine. And I'm very hopeful that we can uh, hold the meeting on the 16th. So- Marilyn, hang on one second. Um, I just wanna make sure where we're actually recording. I don't see the recording light up there. John, recording in progress. Uh, there we go. All right. All right, go ahead. All right, I'll just repeat that, that the special town meeting is being held this Saturday at the public safety complex outdoors. And we're hopeful that um, it will not rain, but we are doing, we will do our best to make the accommodations so it's comfortable. So. so the intent of this forum is to provide information to the voters. Uh, it's intended as an overview and some context for the special town meeting so that people are informed when it comes to voting on town meeting floor, uh, improve the voters understanding of indiv individual warrant articles and offer a voters an opportunity to ask questions. We do the next slide. Uh, this is not intended to take any vote, favorable or unfavorable, provide any group or individual the opportunity to advocate for or against any particular article. Um, yeah, and that applies to all articles. So those are the basic ground rules and uh, let's get started. Give us just a second, please. No problem. Actually, Car Carolyn has the first uh, two articles, so she kind of needs to be here. Yeah, we probably should wait then. David, are we actually all going to speak, or shall we just let Carolyn run through the articles instead of all the speaking? I think they're divided out. Um, well, they are divided out, but I'm just saying for the purpose of this informative meeting tonight, can it just be Carolyn um, or you um, presenting them and then we can do it with whoever is designated um, at the uh, town, <laughs> excuse me, the town meeting itself, just to, uh, in light of it all, just because we're not in front of people, just have somebody able to read it and go forward. Yeah, no, if uh, Carolyn's willing to do that, I, I'm happy to let her take it. So I didn't hear any of that, so hold on. <laughs> you just got volunteered by Joyce. <laughs> I got volunteered to what? <laughs> I, I suggested, Carolyn, that everybody, if you would be willing to just go through the town warrant uh, without all of us jumping in here and there, that you just run through it um, since it is just informative, and then we would take take it from there at town meeting itself and present our articles as designated, but in the light of um, just it being an informative meeting tonight, can you just run through it yourself? Absolutely. Yep. I'll do it as quickly as possible. And if, if, uh, if anybody has a question, just um, David, if it's okay, if they just speak up, um, otherwise I'll just keep moving forward. Um, so I think David, you read the, <coughs> the, the intent of the forum. Yeah, I covered all of that. You covered all of that. Okay, can you go to the next one? Okay, so I'm gonna go over um, the general fund budget. So if you can go to that table, Jennifer. Okay, so these are just adjustments to the uh, FY22 budget. So I am gonna briefly explain those. And this is where if there's any questions, please ask. Um, but I've mentioned, I think at the past several select board uh -huh. meetings, the need for there to be additional uh, clerical support for um, a few of the um, higher level boards in the sense that require a lot more administrative assistance. Um, so there's uh, money allocated for that, as well as um, some increased support to um, some of the, the, the departments that 
need some assistance with posting minutes and doing things like that. So it's just um, providing that extra support that will keep us in line with the requirements of open meeting law and all of those expectations. Um, if you go down to 132, I was very pleased that the Finance Committee um, recommended increasing our, the reserve fund to $100,000. So that's, that's great. Uh, the town accountant, um, if you remember uh, when our, we were contracting out with one of our um, accounting uh, employees um, who uh, was working on her own as a consultant, but we were using her as well as Melanson. And they, we knew this was going to happen, but um, uh, when Mary, who is the accountant that we were um, uh, getting services from, when she chose to uh, go back to work, um, she is now working for Melanson, who is the company we use. So this is a combined uh, it's now they're both working for the same company. It's a great communication. Um, it's, the, it's a really great situation for the town, uh, but it is an additional cost to that contract with Melanson. So that's what that increase is. Um, police and highway, um, these are, um, I'll go over highway first. Um, these, are, we made a change for the ditch support. Uh, that was a capital request, but we felt it was more uh, appropriate as and capital the capital committee agreed as well as the finance committee agreed um, that ditch funding really should be an ongoing expense in the operating this uh, uh, portion of the budget so that is in there um, as well as the police this was a really great opportunity opportunity that Chief Mike Mason brought to our attention about the option of leasing a new vehicle versus uh, purchasing. And so this is a lease that is obviously starting halfway through the year, um, but as, as many leases, you don't have to pay the first three months. So they, that $7,500 may not even occur this year, but we felt it was important to put it in there. Uh, the building inspection salaries, that is specifically for, um, we were having uh, Didi, the uh, administrative person in that office was, doing work uh, for building inspections, but it was coming out of the planning department. Um, at one point, she was able to do both, but the building has, has gotten so busy with inspections that she is in there. That's her primary role. So this is just uh, using that money and it will be the buildings that building inspector salaries will go up $2,000. Um, let's see, Linda's gonna go over. I did wanna, the conservation commission um, 171, that is, as you know, we have a new agent, um, but it, there, it is more costly and uh, that is what the additional support is gonna cost for this year. So I'm gonna have Linda, if there are any questions, are there any questions? Okay, um, I'm gonna have Linda, the treasurer, go over most of the rest of this budget, 710 and 919, and then she is gonna go into the enterprise funds as well. Okay, so uh, because we had uh, a nice free crash figure, which we'll go over later, we'll add uh, money to that we could put into the budget again. Uh, and because we also did not want to, uh, the Capital Planning Committee did not want to take any capital articles to debt exclusion, uh, the Finance Committee approved of increasing the amount that we pay off in principle within the levy by another $50,000. And that allowed the capital to, uh, expand a bit and uh, put uh, move that item up in the uh, in the capital budget and uh, help us stay ahead of our our borrowing without having to uh, increase taxes with a debt exclusion. And the OPEB, this is uh, this always seems to be the first one on the chopping block, but fortunately we have funded it enough times so that we do have a, a healthy balance and uh, we're on our way. Uh, the, our report just came in uh, this week. Um, the OPEB report, it's like, it's a, I consider it an audit, they call it something else, but, um, and it's like board, you'll be receiving that soon that we are, uh, we are still doing well with that. However, um, it is a moving target, always up, of course. So we're going to need, we're going to work harder at getting that reinstated fully for 23, but for 22 uh, for fiscal 22, uh, there was an agreement that we increase it by we put 50,000 towards the OPEB so that we start getting um, back in the swing of uh, funding that item. 
So that's it on the general fund. The total increase is $187,440. And what's next, Jennifer? The, um, oh, so this is the fund, I'm sorry, this is our funding on the, on the uh, what we just did. Our new funding, um, our original funding was uh, lower by that amount of whatever I said, 187,000. And, and um, the way we're funding it was a, a bit more free cash, but mostly as you can see using the ARPA revenue replacement funds. So that's going to work out um, that's going to work out well for us. We have benefited from, from ARPA in this way, and the revenue replacement funds are mainly from our losses in um, hotel, motel, and meals tax, which we're happy to say are really coming back well in the first quarter of FY22, but um, we don't know how it's going to go. So uh, our, re our revenue replacement calculation is based on this past year versus two years ago. So that's our loss. That's the loss that we experienced this past year which we're able to apply to the budget. So that's the only change there. Um, did you want, did you want, oh, where are we? Did you want to speak on the um, stabilization fund that was in that area also so that we can just let people know? We will, we will get there, sure. Um, what, last year we funded the 530,000 for, uh, to fund our FY21 budget and this year we don't need to fund stabilization. So we will have free cash and we'll go over balances. I think they're coming up in a couple of slides. So we'll show how, because we had a, a nice amount of free cash, we are able to put the money back into stabilization. And that's a later article also on this warrant. Okay, so, sorry, Linda, thank you. No, no, that, no, that's fine. It's a good thing to raise now because it's glaring right there showing that we use 530,000. So um, we are going to put that back this year. We also used 300,000 the year before and we we're able to put that most of that back as well. So, um, Great. so far we are, we're coming out of the, uh, we're, we're coming out pretty well. So we're just hoping this continues. We're not, nobody knows for sure how we're going to go. So we're still going to be somewhat cautious, but um, sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Next. Okay, so there are no changes to the sewer, water, or Hadley Media budgets. However, there is change to the funding based, again, on a reduced revenues um, that we experienced in 21. Uh, we are not going to use F, we're not using ARPA uh, money on, on, the, on, on funding the enterprise funds because we don't think we're going to need it. But um, right now we had to, in order to balance it in the paperwork we filed with the state, we had to reduce the projected um, revenues based on our 21 actual revenues. And so in order to compensate for that, we had to, the, the rest is going to be spent out of water and uh, sewer and Hadley Media reserves money. But again, if our revenues come back the way we actually think they may, then we won't be using those reserves either. So, but this was, there's no change to those budgets. This is just a funding change. Okay. Next. Okay, so these are the fund balances that we're going into town meeting with. Um, as we said, the free cash really came in very well. There's a few, um, uh, we are, the actual amount is 1,358,505. Our uh, general stabilization fund is 1,317,919. The goal being 2 million, um, 2 million or higher in that account. CPA funds are uh, before the, uh, going into this meeting, Probably a little higher because I'm a month behind in the revenues uh, changing this figure, but it's two about two million two hundred sixty one thousand five hundred forty nine. Water reserves uh, as of June thirtieth were certified at one million two hundred seventy two thousand two hundred fifty five. Uh, sewer reserves um, were certified at five hundred twenty four thousand three hundred fifty one, and Hadley Media reserves were res uh, were uh, certified at two hundred ten thousand oh seventy two. So you see, we have enough in those enterprise fund reserves to uh, to put into the budget funding, and then see how we go for this year. Are there any more questions, or you want any more explanation on that? Anyone? <laughs> Okay, I will be prepared to answer questions um, on, on those fund balances at town meeting if that comes up. 
So I think I'm done. Back to Carolyn. So article three is uh, just the previous article at uh, a previous year did not cover the whole cost of the signs. So this is just bringing, I think it's um, 375 to be able to cover the cost of all those signs. Next one. So these articles are just returning money that's unspent back to its original source. Do you want me to go over each one? No? Okay. Next one, Jennifer. So these are all the capital articles. Uh, these, the funding for these requests will include borrow, borrowing within the levy and from water, sewer, and Hadley and Media Reserves. So I know that each uh, department head is here who's requested capital. It's up to you. I was hoping that you would give them the opportunity to briefly describe each one. So if anyone had questions, um, would that be all right to do, David, Joyce? They're all here. Let them uh, have a chance to discuss. That sounds good. Okay, Chris, did you wanna talk about the DPW highway? Uh, you can actually address all of the, the articles. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Jennifer, the next slide will show the articles. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And I begin with the highway um, drum or the roller for asphalt. We have an existing one now that is, um, we are not able to get adequate parts. It's been over 22 years. And um, so we also, so we are, we've been requesting for this for the past two or three town meetings to be able to have the ability to use a compactor in our road work. And so that's what we are requesting. That's the DPW Highway Drum Asphalt Roller. We also, ask, we also are asking for two F-350 pick, um, dump trucks. The, the roller is the first one on, on, your, on your left. And then we have um, dump trucks and um, we were initially we were asking for 550, but understanding the budget and the constraints, we we decided to go with F350. Uh, we we have 2001, 2008, and the 1997 truck, and all uh, for now we've been putting a lot of money in them in terms of repairs. Uh, the 1997 truck. Uh, has been twice that uh, the transmission and the motor has been replaced. Uh, it, is, it has no more enough transmission power to even use it as a plow truck. The 2001 and 2008, same, same thing in terms of, uh, so we requested that instead of the town giving us 550, we'll go with 350, uh, be able to do the job in terms of Plan Street, if a 12 month truck, also it will reduce our cost of repairs. So, that are the three items that the, we are asking for. Uh, we did ask for a bigger truck, which should have cost $300,000. It's a, it's a big truck with a um, wing plow, uh, replacing our existing one. But we, we, again, because of the budget and the uh, financial restraint, we felt that we should be able to manage that truck for another year or two. We also requested for 
um, funds for the gas pumps. But that also has been put off because of fiscal uh, situations. So we are very grateful and we are asking that if we can be given this roller and a 2F350 for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris, do you want to hit the sewer pipelining and repairs and the hydrant as well? Uh, yes, the the sewer pipe, um, we have um, a couple of sewer mains and um, because of the age, we have cracks, we have leakage and um, we have um, a lot of uh, in interference with the sewer, outside water coming in. And because of their locations and the depth, uh, we it became obvious that we had to do some repairs. And so the the repairs we are asking for the pipelining is we put in another pipe or some sleeve, um, very thin layer inside. Uh, it's a way to to have another long term use of the, those um, sewer mains, and also to prevent the leakage. Whenever a pipe is cracked because of either uh, tree roots or because of the movement of the earth, uh, it's very expensive. And also when we do our report to the e to EPA, every so often we, the, the amount of water that comes with the sewer into the sewer plant, we have to, what we call I and I, we have to also um, declare that. And so this repair will help us to keep our sewer pipes for many, many more years. The hydrant replacement is also part of our um, safety and the uh, DEP requirements. So we are changing most of our hydrants and we have many valves that are need to be replaced. Uh, so so we, 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 take, we frequently come in, ask for these funds every year. We, we, we focus on one part of town and then we go to the next. Hydrant is very, the ability to make sure that the fire department has the ability to get water. Uh, safety is uh, of utmost priority for us. And so this fund will give us the ability to do that. Okay, Mike Mason, do you want to talk about the PCs and the equipment? Certainly, um, I can talk about the PCs and I can do the next one as well because the fire chief was unable to be here tonight. So I'm gonna be covering for him on those. Uh, he will be able to explain them at town meeting, hopefully uh, with more justice than I can do it tonight. Uh, as far as the, the PCs, as many people know, we write a um, state 911 grant every single year uh, to the tune of 30 or $40,000, which allows us to replace any kind of computer or any IT equipment that we need that has to do with our communications half of our, of our building. Uh, what it does not cover is PCs, uh, computers, and related equipment for the anything outside of dispatch. Um, we are on about a five-year replacement cycle. We're a little outside of that replacement cycle. We're at six or so years. We have replaced a few computers as kind of a one-off, so we don't need to replace all of them, but these are the quotes that we got recently um, from our IT folks uh, for what we do need to replace. Um, the good thing about this is that this capital request is actually in here as a precaution um, because I recently wrote um, a community compact IT grant to the tune of about $142,000 or so, uh, which hopefully, if we are awarded it, will cover um, computers for town hall, computers uh, and some IT equipment for the schools computers for the public safety complex, uh, an updating of our telephone system, and also it will cover some licensing software that both the fire department and DPW need. Um, and it's also gonna cover actually some computers at Council on Aging and DPW. So it's kind of a town-wide thing, um, uh, which I think will hopefully give us a, the best chance of getting it. So I'm pretty hopeful that we're going to get that. And then this article will not be necessary. So that's my hope. And that's the explanation for that. 
Um, I think if we get this grant, it will also be able to remove future capital articles, uh, which will, would be coming up from several of those other town departments that would be requesting things for the future. So hopefully that'll be a big win for us. Uh, as far as the next item, this one is for public safety in general, police, fire, and dispatch. Um, as many of you also probably know, we have been having some problems lately with our radio system. We are at a point where there is certain equipment within our radio system, which is obsolete. Um, they're called voters. And I don't know much about it, but what I can tell you is that uh, they don't make these products any longer. And if we if this portion of the radio system goes down, we will be relegated to using telephones. And we are also in a, in a situation where um, we think that this is part of the reason why we're having so many communication issues. It's becoming a safety issue. Um, and this is a part of the project and it is the part of the project that is the most um, it was done, we, we submitted this with care and knowing that there's other departments that require this, this funding, but we also submitted it knowing that this is, the, this is the part of the project that needs to get done first and right now. Um, there's other parts of it, which we're gonna be talking about hopefully within an operational budget cycle, which will go through obviously the other, the other processes, but that's what that 199 is for. Uh, it's something that is desperately needed. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to replace these this, these parts of the radio. And that's it. Thanks, Mike. And then if Drew's on, Drew typically has this amount each capital request, but I was I can't see the whole view here if Drew is on. So, Amy, you went through this list so well when it was presented to finance. Um, did, was there details? And I, I apologize, I don't have the details for the Hadley Media Reserve request. No worry. There wasn't any, we didn't really get into too many details just okay. because it's a standard thing that they do and they take it right out of the Hadley Media Reserves. Um, so it's, it's, we didn't really get too detailed on this. Okay, great. All right, are there any questions about any of those? Can, can you just say um, what the total amount of all articles were going, oh, you do do that, or borrow 620. In the, motion, in the motion, it goes into details. Okay, all right. But it, will, just, it shows it on the funding source as well. Okay. All right, just wanted to make sure people knew the amount and it was all going to be borrowing. So, um, and if anybody had, if we were going to borrow all this in all past or whatever, could we have some scenarios on what the amount would be on the uh, tax? Joyce, this, none of this is going to uh, be, uh, is going to add to the tax. We have a certain amount of, um, one of our budgets is the debt and interest payment. And okay. when we have an override, um, that's included in, in there. And we raise taxes to pay for what, uh, for the additional amount is a debt exclusion. And that's why we often, was when, when we go to the ballot box to vote on whether we're gonna get a truck or a fire engine or another capital item, that actually increases the taxes. The um, borrowing within the levy means that we have, that means within, uh, within, within our budget. It's basically okay. within our budget without adding to taxes. So our the portion of our debt and interest that is uh, attributable to uh, borrowing within the levy is about three hundred and uh, well, it's been about three hundred thousand. It was lower. Mm -hmm. It was uh, increased to three hundred a couple of years ago, and just today with the uh, adding or or this meeting uh, with adding fifty thousand, we now are up to about three hundred fifty thousand. And the amounts that uh, are within the levy on here are within that total, let's see, it's $354,954. This will be paid where, within the budget, just like another budget article, there will not be- um, That's good. No I, I knew what it was, but I yeah. when people read it or see within the levy, 
they don't always know what that is. So thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I, I understand. I'm glad you asked because I was trying to think of whether to jump in and, and explain that or not, because I think that's uh, it's important to say. And yes. uh, for the borrowing within the water for the water and sewer reserves, we uh -huh. actually have enough money to move it over. But again, we don't know what's going to happen with uh, with income and uh, revenue in those areas. So we thought the safest thing to do is to borrow it and pay those back over five over five years. And that way that would reduce the amount that we're spending out of reserves. And okay. um, so that's how we're doing out. The only one that's a straight transfer is the Hadley Media Reserves because they don't have any, uh, any borrowing. Okay, sounds good, Linda, thank you. Yeah. Sure. I have a curiosity question for Chris Okafer. In the hydrant valve replacement, how many hydrants do you figure you can do in a $60,000 piece. You're muted, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the, the $60,000, uh, the reason why we, 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 we go that, that way is because of in-house. We try to do, um, instead of um, asking for more money and bringing a contractor, we, we, we um, so, to answer the question, it would, we'll be able to do um, somewhere between six and 10 hydrants and valves within that 60,000. And how many hydrants does Hadley have? Huh. I mean, this seems like a little teeny number. Uh, because most of our hydrants are not in danger. So that's just why it's not that um, we, uh, our hydrants, um, um, majority of the hydrants are um, in good shape. So we don't necessarily have to change all of them. And that's just why most of these are old, old ones and probably some toward the dead ends that have not been at the, what we tend to do change more for are the valves. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our article 5.2 is to amend a previous special town meeting article in 2019, which borrowed $30,000 to repair the DPW gas pumps. We would like to uh, redirect those funds to decommission the DPW gas pumps that we have now. Um, as Chris mentioned before, there was a request, request to replace them, um, but it was a significant cost. So we are looking at other options, um, and, but at some point these gas pumps that are in the ground right now um, would have to be de uh, decommissioned. So that is that request to, to reuse that money that's already been borrowed for. Uh -huh. I would like to ask a question on that, please. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently the current gas pumps are not in a condition that is worth fixing them, is that correct? Yes, it's extremely expensive to fix. Okay, them. so does, it sounds to me like ultimately we will not have gas pumps at the DPW. Not necessarily. No, uh, we we have other options. We can certainly go to fleet cards. Um, some towns do that, but we are looking at other options. Um, but right now, regardless, those pumps, whether we um, go to town meeting to get. Uh, at the annual town meeting, if that is, is that it looks like that's a request that's needed um, at the annual town meeting, we're still going to have to decommission this pumps. So we felt like that um, we're not confident that it's Chris, you may be able to explain in more detail what happens in the warmer weather with these gas pumps. Yes. Um, and in the warmer weather, we have, um, we have a uh, vapor lock whereby we are not able to um, because of vapor and because of the type of um, equipment we have, which is uh, it creates a situation where we have uh, five, sometimes 5,000, 4,000 gallons in, in the ground, but we're not able to pump. And so uh, every so often we have to, um, recently we went to Pride uh, to get some gas, we, including the police, the whole department, or we call him for repairs and the cost of repairing, it keeps happening anytime the temperature goes up. So that's why um, 
that has been for the past two, three years that has been happening of more often. So that has led to this situation where we are right now, vapor lock. And our our experts in have recommended that we have to uh, think of either uh, putting a new tank over uh, above ground tanks, or uh, it be a waste of funds to to get a new pump without dealing with the tank uh, with the tanks on the ground. Okay, I, ju I just think this is going to bring up a fair amount of questions at town meeting. That's why I'm asking, just so you guys can be prepared. I'm sure people are going to be concerned that we have no fuel for our for our new vehicles we're intending no. to buy, et cetera, et cetera. No, I appreciate that, Randy. And we will be able to, we'll explain the different options that we're looking at. Um, and we do have we, we do have the ability to buy the, those fleet cards so that they can go to any gas station. We go out to bid. Um, this is what other communities do. Um, the, the issue is that we are, we do have a contract, a regional contract where we per, made, made a commitment to purchase gas at a lower cost. So we still are, um, we still need to uh, use these gas pumps as long as possible this mm -hmm. year. Right. And I think David posted, uh, David Phil posted uh, on Facebook, some options of what is out there for us to do with this, um, these gas tanks and things, which gives a, uh, a perspective of, uh, what's in need or what we need to do or what we can do. So there are a few options out there for us to look at um, as we talk about this. Yeah, one couple quick things on that. Uh, you know, Chris mentioned during the warm weather, we have issues cold weather. Uh, during the winter, we don't have the vapor lock problem. So I believe we have a 10,000 gallon tank of diesel, a 10,000 ga gallon tank of unleaded that are both underground. Uh, the diesel, not a problem with vapor lock, obviously. Diesel doesn't create vapors like unleaded does. Uh, but during the warmer months, uh, there's a big percentage of that 10,000 gallons worth of fuel in the tank that we can't actually pump out of the ground um, because of the vapor lock. So we've got basically money tied up underground that we can't access during warmer weather. Um, so that's an issue. The other issue is if the tanks do need to be replaced, uh, our understanding is that DEP would most likely require those tanks to be above ground tanks due to their location versus underground tanks we currently have. And if you've been down to the DPW yard, you know that space is at a premium down there. And then, so, you know, we've, we've got a lot to work out in this process before we decide whether we're going to put new above ground tanks or we're going to, you know, do some sort of repairs or if we're going to go to a fleet card, but we, we have to, you know, we have to think about all the options here before we move forward. Sounds good. Further, further discussions. So article six is transferred to stabilization fund and this would transfer $750,000 of free cash to that fund. Um, this really, the important thing here is this really turn the stabilization fund to previous levels and continue to follow the policies that the select board um, would, would like to pursue and has put in a policy. So um, I think, Joyce, this is probably a favorite article of yours, right? Yes, absolutely. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, it is. I, you know, our stabilization is there for us to use as we need to use. And certainly if we have the opportunity and what a blessing right now that we've been able to um, have that extra cash and stabilize uh, and free cash um, that we can now bring that back up to the uh, level that we like it to be uh, because that helps us with our AAA rating, but it also gives us a cushion and that's our, that's our savings there that if we need something, it's there. Um, so this is a great thing for us to have to do. And, you know, what a landfall you know, we, that we've gotten for the, for the cash. So um, thanks to whoever gave us the cash, because it sure does help. <laughs> this one is just a vote to accept ownership of the Goodwin Memorial Library from the trust, trustees of the Goodwin Memorial Library um, so that it can be used for general purposes. This, was, uh, this never was officially done. It has to be done at town meeting once the the library vacated the old library and moved into the new one. 
Um, this is just a legality that needs to take place. Is Another there history? Yeah, Go is, ahead, there, is there history on this? I, I think most people would assume that the town owns the library now. So yeah, there was a yeah. Explain. There was an assumption. We found out about the uh, the trustees were on the deed when Mass DOT went for right of ways and were taking property, and um, they sent us information um, to be filled out. And the deed actually has it's to the good uh, it's good to the trustees of the Goodwin Library. So that's why we're doing it. I, we wouldn't have known about it, I think, unless Mass DOT was doing their widening project. So it was just no, a trigger, I and we thought we'd clean it up. I get it. I knew it quite some time ago. I did a survey for V1 Vodka, the St. John's oh. Church, and I needed to look into the library and I saw that and I, I was quite surprised. Great. Uh -huh. All right, I didn't know if um, members of CPA wanted to go over the next few articles. Is anybody here from CPA? I, I am Mary Thayer, I'd be glad to. Um, Thanks Mary. The, the first article up is the um, Gnotic mural. This is really large if it's hanging on a wall in the library, it's about a little over four feet by 11 feet. It was painted 65 years ago by John Gnotic, um, who is a Hadley native, wonderful artist. And it's been, donated by Ted Michikowski to the town, to the library to um, be hung there. It has, um, the frame needs some work to be fixed and it needs to be restretched. There's some cleaning that needs to be done and repair work and then they'll varnish it to help it last many years into the future. And it was painted right before the Hadley 300th and we made postcards out of it for the Hadley 350th. So it's now hanging in the library and um, this would this is the amount that would be needed to really bring it bring it completely up to snuff and to be enjoyed for years in the future. Beautiful, beautiful. Next, um, the pavilion at the Hadley Elementary School has been built with CPA funds and has now lighting and and it has a one lone um, picnic table in it. So these are funds to um, get some the picnic tables and they've chosen some really nice, um, nice picnic tables to put in there. So this is kind of to finish up the project that's um, mostly done and, and really has been funded with CPA dollars all along. Mary, isn't this the one where you said the, the dollar amount is not correct? Well, they had and I, I pulled the 6400 they had asked for. They have money left over from the last request, um, and they only needed about 2,500, 2,553. Um, but we've been going back and forth a little bit, and they're going to firm up the figures before Saturday. Um, it's probably better to have any extra money goes back to CPA if there's a little bit too much. So um, Tim Nyhart's working on how much they're waiting for a bill from the electrician. So how much is actually left over to make sure they have enough money? The picnic tables will cost 6,400, but they shouldn't need all of it now. So I'm, um, I'm not quite sure what, what it, at the most it'll be 6,400. All right, well, as you said, whatever's left goes back. So it's not a huge deal. Right. Next one, please. Um, the preservation of the columns at, at town hall and the CPA committee um, had already voted some money a few years ago, about 30,000. Um, and that actually isn't enough to do both the restoration and the painting and, and the municipal building committee is gearing up to getting the work done. So this 31,000 is what they say they'll need to do the entire job to repair the columns and then to be able to paint them after. This one um, is for the Golden Court with the Amherst Hadley Authority, Housing Authority um, has requested 
the whole project is a lot more expensive. They get most of it paid for from um, the state. And let me just get the right thing here. Um, so we're actually paying a small, this would be a small part of it. However, it would be about 40% of it. Um, however, it is, you know, it's to replace 131 windows at Golden Court plus their community room. This falls under the CPA because it's helping to preserve the, the housing. And we don't put much, we haven't used the housing fund very much. Um, we've done some, the 25,000 for the rent assistance and then some small ones over the years. Um, so they came before us to ask us for the, the state part won't pay 100%. So they requested the balance of the 75,000. 75, I, I guess that was the question. I certainly have no problem uh, expending this CPA because the majority of the residents uh, from Hadley live um, in the Golden Court. I think other people outside of us that know about this, they feel that um, Golden Court is the responsibility of the state. Um, so a lot of people have asked, well, how come we have to kick in money or whatever we have to do when things um, happen over at Golden Court? And I, I, I think I'd like to have at least some explanation for people at town meeting of why we do this. I feel because we you know, want to protect and, and enhance our elders um, when they live at Golden Court, that would be my uh, rationale of to why we do it. But is there any other thing of why, um, you know, state-wise or whatever, of, of why they don't do it themselves in taking care of this project? My understanding from what um, the representative said was it's, it's the state is paying 109000 and they don't pay 100%. So they really rely on the housing authority to find local sources for um, for improvements like this. And they've been encouraging housing authorities to look at CPA funds. Um, and it's it can't be used for everything. It can't be used for like redoing kitchens or redoing bathrooms, but it can be used for the protecting the building. Um, so the windows certainly help to protect okay. the building. Um, I think that might be one of the questions why what people might ask at town yeah. meeting. So mm -hmm. it's always good to be prepared on why we kick in money because the state, as usual, doesn't right. pay the whole percentage. So we, you know, will also um, be a part of that um, money wise. Okay. Any other comments on this? Next slide, slide please. Um, last year in June, the Hadley voters um, voted to establish the Hadley Affordable Housing Trust. And um, in there, in the bylaws for the Hadley Affordable Housing Trust, they talk about their ability to use CPA funds. Um, I may ask Bill Dwyer to, to talk more about this if he would like to or, or um, somebody else. Because um, I think they'll they'll be able to do it more thoroughly. Sure, I'm happy to talk about it. So this is sort of a quirk, quirky area of state law where if you have a housing, affordable housing trust fund, the affordable housing trust fund can take operational control of the affordable housing set aside from the Community Preservation Act. Um, as Mary mentioned, this is a part of the CPA pot that has rarely been touched. And um, it's an esoteric area of state law. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which at the moment consists of um, two representatives of the select board and five representatives of the planning board, um, the initial setup of the uh, trust fund was because we had been looking at affordable housing issues for several years. And we have some expertise in this area already. 
and having the funds in the hands of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund will allow for it to be deployed more quickly if an opportunity presents itself. Uh, there is nothing on the, uh, nothing out there now, but uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund can, uh, can vote with support of the select board without having to wait for the next town meeting if something comes up that requires quick action. So what would be the difference between this fund and the last article we just looked at about the windows for Golden Court support? Would the Golden Court, should they be doing that again, go now to the housing fund, to the uh, affordable housing trust, or would they still go to the town? Well, there will still be uh, over $100,000 left with CPA in the affordable housing set aside. The money that would be transferred to the affordable housing trust fund could only be used in accordance with the CPA rules anyway. So it would provide um, something like the Golden Court proposal theoretically could go either way. But if um, the, let's say the affordable housing, let's say the CPA grant to the Golden Court renovations is approved, and this eventually goes, I'm not sure if it's gone out to bid yet, but if it did go out to bid, and it was determined that the lowest responsible bid was actually $20,000 above what had been appropriated, the project would have to wait until Springtown meeting to get more money, presumably, from CPA, whereas it could come directly to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and we could act more expeditiously without having to wait till spring. The balance in the um, set aside for housing, the current balance is 308,000. So there still would be 208,000 left in that set aside. And um, any of the, of the 2,261,000 in the general, well, that's not, not all general fund, but there's a lot in the general fund um, can be used for any of the three categories, the historic, the housing, or the recreation and open space. Um, so housing is not limited to 308,000, but that 308,000 can only be used for housing. Any other questions on that? No, nope. good job, Mary, thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. So Bill, since you're unmuted still, I hope, do you wanna to speak to this? Uh, sure, hang on a sec. So this is primarily a housekeeping issue. Um, this uh, section 17 is the farmland preservation bylaw, which we also know as the transfer of development rights bylaw. And it broke the town into two districts. Basically the idea was another way to fund preser land preservation. Um, and the money that we collect by, a, well, we, we, we have the ability by special permit to allow developments in the business district and the industrial district to proceed with less than the minimum required parking or uh, with greater density if it appears that that would not be a problem, that there would be no adverse consequences from that. And in return, the business that is seeking the special permit makes a payment to, the, um, uh, to a fund according to a formula that is in the larger bylaw. And that is part of the source of the funding for uh, purchase of the town's portion of APR uh, restrictions. Anyway, that's a lot of background, but in the course of dealing with a uh, 
project on the industrial in the industrial district, but on South Maple Street, we realized that the wording uh, of the receiving district, which originally said lots within the business and industrial zones with frontage on Russell Street or North Maple Street, was inadequate. It left out areas of the business district that could benefit from using transfer of development rights. And some, uh, since we adopted this about 15 years ago, some of, the, um, some of the boundaries have changed. For instance, the industrial district on North Maple Street was intended to capture the uh, Venture Way, what we now know as Venture Way, an industrial park. But because that was laid out as a subdivision road, many of the lots on Venture Way no longer have frontage on North Maple Street. So uh, we saw that there were just a lot of loose ends. Uh, it is a 15 plus year old bylaw. So we decided that we would clean it up by uh, specifying that the receiving district would be all lots within business and industrial zones with frontage on a public way. They would still have to get a special permit. So this is not a blanket approval of density increases or parking reduction. It is just opening up the land area that can apply for the special permit. Would they have to go to the ZBA bill or no? Uh, the special permit is from the planning board. Okay. So they could come, if a project came in, for site plan approval and they wanted to increase their density, we would take care of that simultaneously. Mm -hmm. so One-stop shopping. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Then the mosquito control, this article will provide the town an opportunity to opt out of the mosquito spraying program provided by the state. This was a commitment the select board made in the spring to put this on the special town meeting warrant. And that's Any it. Questions? That's it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer, for putting that PowerPoint together. And um, excuse me, are you taking any comments or questions? Yeah, sure. I, th I thought we were, the questions were going to happen when we went through each article, so I'm sorry. Bobby, you're muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, my name is Bobby Kamen or Roberta Kamen. I'm a resident 85 Mount Road, uh, uh, Mount Winter Road in Hadley. I have a question about the mosquito control as, uh, vote. I uh, was listening to the last select board meeting and a statement was made that um, mosquito control does not harm honeybees. Um, I, that isn't totally accurate. It does harm them depending on what kind of spraying and when it's done. Um, I read the state regulations and it says it's done between 7 p.m. and 10, uh, 8, 4 a.m. And during that time, honeybees are out. They, particularly in this warm weather, they hover around the hive. They, they kind of hang out in the porch, front porch as such. And so the statement that it does not harm honeybees is not totally accurate. The spray they use, I've been reading up on Anvil 10 plus 10, on contact with honeybees can be damaging. So yes. I would be careful with a statement such as that. I, also, this, my, the statement came directly uh, from MDAR itself. Hey, everybody. Um, the ground rules we laid out is that this there's no advocating for or against any of these articles. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, I have one other question. I have a specific question that's not advocating or not. In making the recommendation, what has been the council consultation or input on this most recently from the Board of Health in Hadley? This is a town meeting warrant article that we put on uh, since we promised the uh, during that discussion in the spring that we would bring it to town meeting. Uh, okay, let me be more specific. I'm sorry to interrupt. My more specific in my question. 
I understand that the select board is going to make a recommendation not to opt out. And I want to know if making that recommendation consideration and discussion was held with the Board of Health. What, what was behind that um, decision? The Board of Health uh, doesn't make this decision. And actually part of the reason that I'll say that the vote was, I believe, four to one to not opt out was because of the state denying uh, just about everyone who has applied to the program the ability to opt out of the program. So we can want to opt out as much as we want. The problem is the state is, uh, I believe it is uh, DAR. Is that what it is, Amy? That, uh, Okay, I read it. It's the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. They were the ones that um, will essentially decide. So it's not, you know, we can say all that we want. You know, we want to opt out as a town. <clears throat> well, we don't really have the authority to do that. Um, so the only ones that will be exempt um, if they did decide to spray would be certified organic farms. That would be the only ones that would be. I'm not going to discuss, time. argue this now because it's not the time, but I, I just read it a little differently. I'm reading on the MDAR website and it, it, the information is a little bit different than, than I, what I hear you say. So perhaps that discussion can be had at a later time. Okay. Thank you. I, I think we're also, are we going to be able to have that letter from the state from the Joel Comfort had sent to us available for everybody at town meeting. Can we attach that to the uh, mm -hmm. report and the articles? Yeah, I can, cop I, I can copy all of the information I have and make it available at town meeting. All right, I, I think that'll, well, I don't know if it's gonna satisfy every, everybody or whatever, but at least they'll have the information that we've received from DEP and from the state. Yeah, somebody's going to need to be very prepared to defend this or whatever, whatever is appropriate, but there's going to be a lot of questions, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. make sure somebody has, we have a knowledgeable person that can answer questions for this and, one, please. And that's, and that's nobody because yeah. yeah, it's, I think that, you know, it's an open ended uh, conversation of whether or not you want your community to be sprayed for mosquitoes. And then we also have the state on the other hand, telling us what we can do or can't do, or whether we can opt out or cannot opt out. So we're gonna bring all the materials to the meeting and hopefully people can make that decision. It's not our decision as a select board, it will be the decision of the people and whether or not that's able to go through we don't know, but we're going to at least present the facts that we should. Okay. I appreciate that, Joyce. That's well said. Yeah. And, and Randy, I, I always invite um, our legislators there. And Senator Comfort is, uh, Comfort, Senator Comfort is very um, aware of this, has been very involved with it. Um, if she's able to be there, she will certainly be able to provide a lot of information. And, and certainly if our Board of Health wants to chime in on the uh, mosquito spraying. I mean, we certainly welcome them to um, yeah. bring any materials or anything that they have to town meeting to uh, help us uh, make this decision. I'm, I'm more than welcome. I'm happy to have them come and, and present their um, sides to this. Yeah, the, the Hadley Board of Health, We I spoke to the select board when this issue first came up. The Hadley Board of Health uh, voted to support the opt-out okay. uh, measure. Would you speak to that, Susan, at town meeting? Uh, sure. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. So then people would have that um, side of that also. So that would be good. Anybody else out there that wanted to ask? Uh, I saw a hand on Gary's iPhone. Is that was that a question, Gary? I see Michelle Morris Friedman's hand is up. Uh, okay. Andy, you talk. Oh, hi, actually it's Andy. I'm the one who has the question. I'm just a little confused about the ward article and what we're voting on. So a yes vote on this article 
means you want the town to opt out of mosquito spraying. And a no vote means you want the town to do the spraying if the state offers it. Yes. And, and when it gets to that point, if the state decides that we are in a high risk or a medium risk elevation, then whether you opt out or not, the state will spray and will notify everyone. Right, I, I understand. So yes vote means no spraying and a no vote means yes to spray. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's very confusing, but yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on the town meeting warrant articles? No. All right. Well, that's it for that. Um, so we will close the public forum for the special town meeting. And then uh, Amy, is, does finance have anything for the rest of the meeting or do you guys wanna uh, close the, uh, your portion of the meeting as well? We don't have anything else, so we could close our portion as well, please. All right. Well, thanks finance committee uh, members for joining us. So David, could, could you just say time and place once more for everybody? Uh, Carolyn, do you want to do that so I don't get the wrong <laughs> It's this Saturday, October 16th at the Public Safety Complex um, outside at East 11. Street. At East, 11. Street. East Street. East Street, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, John is here. Um, and now that we're in the actual select board meeting portion, uh, Jane Evans-Smith, David Phil, Joyce Chunglo, Amy Parsons, and John Muscovitz are all here and all votes will be taken via roll call. Uh, let's hit the 3.1 consent agenda. We have warrants AP2214V, AP2214S, AP2214, AP2213, AP2213S, and PR2207. We have minutes from May 12th, 2021. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Anything on this? Uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Evan Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump down to 5.1 because I see the person, uh, Liam from Kestrel, has been here qu quite some time. Um, Liam, are you still are you ready to go with this? Hi there. Sorry. Yes, I'm ready to go. All right. Great. So Kestrel is uh, requesting that we designate a portion of the Hadley Reservoir land as part of the Robert Frost Trail system. Um, so I will let Liam, I'll let you kind of describe what you're trying to do and what you're asking for. Yeah, sure. So I can just share my screen to show the map, but just as background, um, the Robert Frost Trail has been around since the early 1980s and it currently runs from the Notch Visitor Center in Amherst up to Wendell State Forest. And originally the intent was to have the trail continue through the Western Holyoke Range. So Kestrel Land Trust um, in collaboration with DCR has selected a route on existing trails essentially. We originally liked the idea of building this trail that had been scouted by the people who created the trail, but DCR didn't want new trails built. So this is the route in orange that we ended up settling on. And as you can see, it passes through some of the reservoir lands. So namely this parcel here, and then I think it enters Amherst College land and then two more parcels before staying on DCR land for the rest of the route. So essentially these trails already exist um, and what we're asking for is to designate them as part of the Robert Frost Trail. So that's the project in a nutshell. And one of the questions I had asked um, uh, the person that originally contacted me was, uh, 
this designation won't interfere with any of the other approved recreational conservation uses for that property, correct? Correct. Yeah. All uses like including mountain biking and any allowed uses are not going to cease on this trail. It's just going to be part of this larger route. Okay. Motion to accept. Second. All right. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on this? Does that go across any private land? I see there's a budding property there. So it does cross uh, Amherst College land. That, that was the, uh, I can share my screen again. And then there's also a Peckham Industries, which is also John Lane and Son. That's the parcel that the New England Trail goes up Bear Mountain on as well. So that's the one in red. And the RFT does cross private land on other parts of the corridor, which kind of was done in a handshake agreement, but except for Amherst College and the quarry land here, it doesn't cross private land in this section. Okay, hey, anything else on that? Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Chungaloo? Yes, I said. Thank you. Um, Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Liam. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. All right, you too. All right. So we'll go back up to uh, 4.1 public comments. Uh, we're going to limit this to 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes each so that others may have an opportunity to speak. Um, anyone that's here for public comments, turn your camera on, wave at us, let you know you're here. Let us know you're here. Michelle? Uh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I'm not ready with my question yet. I'm cross-referencing um, the agenda on another device. Okay. Okay. There might be somebody else. Okay. Anybody else here for public comment? Michelle, if it's okay, I'll come back to you in just a minute if you're not ready. Andy has a question, meantime. Okay, go ahead, Andy. Uh, hi, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've recently uh, submitted a letter of interest for the open at-large position at the Community Preservation Act Committee. And I just wanna thank the select board for considering my application. Uh, I'm hoping to be back on the committee. Uh, I really believe strongly in the mission um, and uh, think I did good work while I was on it. So I'm hoping that you will give me a second opportunity to serve the town in this way. Thank you. Um, and, and I'll say some of my comment now, I don't have the cross-referencing. The discussion about the vaccination, I would strongly urge you to have a separate meeting and um, deliberately invite the public, not have people having to go through the select board agenda. It's a question of concern to a lot of people in town. Um, and it is not something that's um, easy to know that's happening in advance. If you have to navigate through the website to find the agenda, to find the item on it. So I would love to have that discussion with the whole board of health, the select board and any other board that's relevant to it with the public invited. Okay. Um, I'll just real quickly hit on that. Uh, we have a due date from the state of tomorrow. That's why we're holding this today. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of, of putting this off uh, to a later time. Um, so, so we do need to do this tonight and hit everything that was required by the Attorney General. So. Can you explain exactly what is due tomorrow? Because I thought there was an extension till October 25th uh, of our current COVID policies. Yes. So 
GP laws here, and I'll let him speak to that since he has better knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I don't know what you're talking about with respect to an extension, but no, the uh, AG's office gave us until the 14th to uh, comply with the open meeting law, or at least to revamp our agenda and then revote and take a, do a rediscussion of our May 12th uh, meeting regarding a COVID update. So what you've seen from the agenda, it went from COVID update to a significantly more uh, detailed agenda. And the board tonight will discuss the same things that they discussed on May 12th. Um, that will satisfy the AG. Uh, with respect to additional discussions or the like, you know, that that's something that may or may not be taken up at another meeting. Okay, so you do not have to make the decision about the vaccination tonight. You just have to discuss it in a public forum. There has to be that discussion in the public forum, yes. And it, yeah. and, and it would be along the same lines that we happen, that happened in, on May 12th. Essentially, what we are doing is a do-over of May 12th after a more detailed posting of the agenda. Okay. okay. Any other public comments? Last call. There are some people who thought they might be here in a little while. So I don't know if they can raise their hand if they, because this is a short window here. I mean, the meeting was supposed to start at six. Um, and right, but not everybody wanted to go through the town meeting warrant. Anyway, that's fine. I'll, no more questions for right now. Okay. Anybody else for public comment before I move on? Okay. Uh, we'll go down one, to- One more question, I'm sorry. Sure. Was the Board of Health invited to participate in this discussion? Uh, the Board of Health, I believe, is here or was here. Um, uh, oh, she's gone now. Yeah. So, okay. Um, we'll move down to, um, let's see, did I skip anything? We have 6.2, Northampton Board of Health MOU. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to cover that real quick? Oh, it says Dr. Moser will be here, but I don't see her on Dr. Moser was here to discuss that. Okay. Well, I'll skip that for now and we'll come back if she pops back on. Uh, we'll go to 7.1, single precinct. Do you wanna talk about that? So that is um, the, the state re requires that each town after the, I, I think it's after the census, they take a look at what your population is based on the size of your community, whether you want to change the precinct um, Jessica would have more details, but it's basically the, the recommendation is to remain one single precinct based on the size of this town, you have that option. So it's, it was just, it's really a um, kind of a housekeeping thing. Every single community had to reply. So you guys have to officially vote on remaining one precinct. I'll make that motion for us to stay on one precinct. Yeah. I'll okay. Okay, so motion by Joyce, second by John. Any other discussion on remaining one one place to vote in town? Okay, Jennifer. Roll call, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Changalo? Yes. Miskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. It looks like Susan Mosler is coming oh, right okay. back. Good. Dr. Moser, are you here? I am now, yes. Okay. Uh, could you talk about the Northampton Board of Health MOU and what, what we're trying to do there? Yes. Uh, the state uh, has had uh, what's called the CTC. It's a contact tracing collaborative. Uh, and that um, uh, organization has done all of our COVID contact tracing uh, work in Hadley, which is uh, quite extensive given all the businesses that we have. The state is shutting down the CTC. I believe uh, it was supposed to be October 1st, but I think now it's as of the end of November. And they are wanting local governments, they're turning over all the contact tracing responsibility to local governments. 
understanding that small towns like Hadley don't really have the capacity uh, or wherewithal to do that type of work, uh, they've uh, encouraged uh, collaborative agreements you know, uh, uh, across uh, local municipalities. And uh, Northampton applied for and received a large grant. Uh, they've hired three new public health uh, people and actually the state asked them to apply for more. So they're going to have even a fourth person. And they have assured me that they will be able to do all of our contact tracing. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's a win-win. It's, it's a real plus for Hadley because we are responsible for getting it done, yet we don't have the staff uh, uh, to do it. Okay, so we're voting on the MOU so we can join with Northampton, right? All right. I'll make a motion to accept the MOU with Northampton for the uh, public health um, to help us out. How much is this going to cost, Susan? Oh, yeah. I need a second. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. All right. Motion by Joyce, second by Amy. John, what was your question? Uh, how much is this going to cost us, Susan, or is it all in the grant money? It or? doesn't cost us anything. Okay. Any other discussion on this? All right, Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? She said yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Uh, let's go down to uh, business not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Uh, Eversource, streetlights, letter of intent. Um, a couple of years ago, we started looking at converting our streetlights to LED. It was too expensive at the time, somewhere in the range of $75,000 to do. And obviously we don't have just cash laying around to do that. Um, it looks like Eversource may have a grant or in subsidy program available this year if we can get this done by December 31st of this year, where we'll be able to uh, convert all our lights uh, to LED for the cost of around $15,000. Um, and based on our monthly charges for leasing our current 138 or 142 streetlights, depending on which list you look at, uh, the project would pay for itself in about seven months in, in uh, electricity savings and leasing savings, um, not to mention being better for the world. So um, we are working on procurement for vendors who will be doing the conversion process but as part of the process, Eversource would like uh, us to sign a letter of intent that we are going down this road so they can start getting their paperwork in order. And like everything Eversource, it takes a while. So they, they want this done ASAP. So what I'm asking for is if the board would give me uh, permission to sign that letter of intent on behalf of the select board. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Amy. Any other discussion on this? Uh, in some of those street lights, it's the ones in some of the municipal parking lots also? There, there are, yes. There's some, I believe, at the school. There's some, I know the one at Town Hall was already LED uh, that we, we had added at the back of Town Hall, but I believe there's a couple at the library. If not, I think the good one, there's one outside there. And police station, how about those lights? Or are those different? I believe our town maintained already, not, not leased from Eversource. All right. Okay, uh, Jennifer? Real call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Excuse me one moment. I, I may not have been paying attention, but I thought I was. I think you had two motions on the table at once. You were started with the light thing. Somebody made a motion and a second. And then David, you asked for a motion and a second to allow you to sign it. Did the first motion go through? No, there, there was only one motion to uh, allow me to sign the, the letter. Right, but wasn't there one to, to start the whole process of or was, or was the whole intent just to get you to be able to sign? 
Yeah, the, the uh, letter of intent does start the process. Okay. All right, because I thought I heard you twice. Nope. Um, okay, so we'll go down to announcements here for the bylaw committee. Uh, select board is seeking members for the bylaw committee, community preservation act committee, and cemetery committee. Please submit your letters of interest to info at hadleyma.org. And I believe we are going to close those for the next meeting, correct, Jennifer? Yes. Also, historical has one opening too. Okay, great. So if you're interested in any of those, send Jennifer an email and we'll get you on the list. Thank okay. you. And then let's go back up to- seven. Wait, wait. We're in a little bit of a conflict on when that exact next meeting is going to take place before you say next meeting. So we aren't really scheduled for another meeting this month. I think we're adding one. Oh, you little devil, you. <laughs> Uh, is that a secret? <laughs> I think I'll go back to the minutes from last meeting when you said camping season was over and you want to have it as <laughs> possible. <laughs> yes, but we also we also have Legion dinners coming up now started. Well, I, I asked him to do the 27th, not the 20th, because I knew you wanted to go to the Legion dinner. All right. You're safe, Jen. <laughs> I was protecting Dave there. Oh, David. Never mind me. Just David. <laughs> I was making sure you got to have meatloaf. I knew you wanted meatloaf. Oh, absolutely. Joni Seuss goes in on that. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So we will go to uh, under old business 7.2, which will be the last uh, item for tonight before executive session. And so 7.2 is posted as COVID-19 policy update. And Jeff Blake is here from KP Law. So Jeff, can you... Give us a summary of what the AG said, what we're doing tonight, and uh, you know we have some requirements we have to meet. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as, as you know, I'm Jeff Blake from KP Law, your town council. Um, a, a meeting for uh, to discuss a COVID-19 update was held on May 12th. There was an open meeting law complaint that said that the agenda item that simply said COVID-19 update was woefully inadequate. Uh, the AG found that in fact, the board had discussed a proposed vaccine, uh, vaccine policy, which contained four key elements, um, whether the town would, uh, uh, would not deny members of the public access to, public, uh, to town property, meetings or events based upon vaccine status, and or whether it would require uh, medical documentation of that status, um, whether the town uh, would require employees to be vaccinated, whether the vaccination status would not have an impact on the ability of an uh, individual to hold an elected or appointed position in town, and the town would not maintain copies of medical records of such vaccination records. Uh, during your discussion, apparently it was a 20-minute discussion on the topic, um, you uh, were discussing the vaccine policy, and you also discussed the merits of the mandatory vaccination for participants in the so, uh, senior center recreational programs, the possibility that requiring COVID-19 vaccines would lead to requiring other subsequent vaccines in the future, the board's role in setting health policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Board of Health and state and federal guidelines, the so-called emergency authorization status of currently available vaccines, the prevalence of asymptomatic spread, uh, medical uh, autonomy, and seeking to avoid implementing a potentially discriminatory policy, and of course, privacy and the, and the HIPAA regulations. You uh, ultimately voted to approve the policy. The AG found that the agenda item of saying simply COVID-19 update was not sufficient, and they found an open meeting law violation and, and requires us to uh, go back through and essentially, as, as I said earlier, um, to do a do-over. And that is they're requiring us to again hold a discussion of the same topics that you discussed at that May 12th meeting, including re-voting any votes taken at a properly posted fu future meeting, which is tonight. We had 30 days to, to do this and send them back a letter. As you know, I've drafted up a response for the town administrator to send over to the AG 
Uh, but uh, what we'll need to do tonight is we'll need to go back through and I, I guess recreate as best we can the, uh, the, the meeting that you held back on May 12th. I'm sure that you have meeting minutes because I think you just uh, approved them. So you can certainly go through there and take whatever votes you had taken. Um, this is retrospective and looking backwards because we're trying to recreate. I think that a lot of, of ground has been plowed since then. For example, we no longer have the emergency authorization. Now we have full authorizations for at least Moderna, I think all three, Moderna, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and the Pfizer. Um, so we're going to have to kind of, uh, of act like we, we were discussing what happened back in May and the, and the status of what was going on there. And of course, um, take the vote that you, that you took uh, during that meeting. Okay. So this is not a new discussion. We're simply replaying what happened in May. I, I think that, that's, that that is correct. Yep. That doesn't seem to meet the open meeting law of telling people what's going on and giving them a chance to be at an open meeting and have a conversation. Well, we we are we're trying to, to we're trying to write what they, they said was a wrong. Um, I, I think that we've drafted the agenda item such that it is wide open. Um, so, you know, I'm saying that you can't dis that I'm not saying you can't discuss present day. But what I am saying is what the AG is requiring us to discuss is what happened back on May 12th and revote those particular votes. Okay, so we need to go down this list here. Um, so the reason this came up initially was that there was uh, some employees that had come to me that were concerned about uh, mandatory vaccinations at the time. Um, one of the first things we talked about was mandatory vaccination for participation at the senior center. I think at the time, and Jane, you can correct me if I was wrong, um, we were requiring those with uh, proof of vaccine to uh, participate in some of the physical fitness activities that were occurring there. I think that was what happened. That's correct. Haley is also here if you would like to hear from her. Okay. And uh, so as part of that discussion, um, you know, things had opened back up at the kind of opened back up at the time. And uh, I believe what we had said was that, uh, well, the vote in the end was that we were not going to require vaccines in order to access, you know, the senior center, town buildings, et cetera. But uh, if the concern was employees accessing the senior center during recreational programming hours, we don't know any employees who really do that. No, we don't. It was employees and also residents that had the issue. Okay, but that's not what you said. I think, that, I think I'd like to clarify that because we did have concern about um, fire or police accessing um, some of the programs that we had at the senior center and the requirements of them being vaccinated to come into the center. I think some of that uh, came from that. If, is that correct, David? Yeah, that is correct. There was, uh, I guess uh, someone was asked, a police officer was asked for a vaccination card, I believe, or asked about their vaccine status, which they felt very uncomfortable with at the time. And it was brought to our attention. Uh, it was for, I believe, Coffee with a Cop or one of those programs that occur at the senior center. And that was uh, part of the concern. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it, where it came from, Jane, is that, um, our, our employees of the town were asked to produce um, their vaccination cards or their vaccination, uh, whatever they needed to actually enter the senior center. And I think that's where all of this came about that we felt uncomfortable um, asking our town employees to produce any type of vaccination cards or whatever, if they were masking and going into that and doing proper uh, uh, safety uh, with their masks and things of that nature, then we felt that it was all right for them to enter any public building as in any individual that lived in town. And I think, I think that's where we all got to miss on things about um, our public buildings and our public employees and our town employees and how we felt about them being totally vaccinated. And 
you know, we were talking about that um, at that time. So going down the list here, um, number two, requiring COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, that was one of the topics of discussion for uh, whether or not we were going to require COVID-19 vaccines for the public in order to access, say, town hall, the senior center, the enter the lobby of the police station, et cetera. Uh, that policy says that uh, there would be basically no discrimination between vaccinated and unvaccinated, and uh, that, frankly, we don't know people's personal health issues. Uh, rather just follow CDC guidelines. If a mask is required, wear the mask and uh, go from there. Um, select board's role in setting health policy and state and federal guidelines. Um, the, I'm trying to think back to this. So as we know, the Board of Health has a order currently in place for indoor mask use of a mandatory indoor mask use within town in public places, uh, you know, stores, town buildings, et cetera. Um, so they have the ability to set that um, requirement. Uh, the select board sets the policy for accessing town buildings as, you know, as far as administratively what our policies are. And, and David, that's whether or not you've been vaccinated or not that a ma mask mandate is in place. Correct. Yep, it has been. Currently, and Dr. Mulzer can correct me, but it's being renewed every, th or looked at every 30 days, whether or not to renew it. I think September 25th was the last time it was renewed. So it'll probably be coming up for re-examination soon. Um, Number four, emergency authorization status of currently available COVID-19 vaccines. Obviously that's changed, but um, we're looking back here. At the time when we had this discussion, uh, there was nothing that was fully FDA approved, which was one of the topics that was discussed um, at the time. And there were, that was one of the issues with some of the employees was they were not willing to take something that they considered to be um, experimental at the time. Um, and please jump in if there is anything more to that discussion that, or any, any of these items that I'm missing here. And Jeff, how am I doing so far? Am I hitting what I kind of need to hit? I think you are, yes. Uh, prevalence of asymptomatic spread. I believe one of the conversation topics of that night was um, that the mandating vaccines or people having vaccines was very important because, uh, you know, you could be feeling great, not showing any outward signs of COVID, but, you know, if you went into the, to the senior center to do some physical fitness activity, you could be spreading it to everybody in there, uh, without your knowledge. Um, so that was one of the reasons for, uh, I believe those were that were in favor of mandating vaccines or asking about vaccine status at the time. Uh, number six, potential for discriminatory policy. This was, if I remember, one of the, the longer discussions of how do you tell a, a taxpayer that's paying for a senior center or a library or um, you know taxes in town that they can't go into town hall to pay their water bill or can't go take out a book out of the library based on their vaccine status. Um, we talked about that a little bit. Um, Joyce, what else am I missing on that one? I, I thought we talked more about that one, but. I, I think we actually said that a, even if people were going in to go into any public buildings or town halls, that everybody is mandated whether or not they're vaccinated to wear a mask. Um, and it just makes everybody feel safe or whatever that they need to do. Um, and then that's just what we require. And again, uh, our board of health now has come out and has mandated that everybody wear a mask when they go into any public buildings, whether or not you are vaccinated because of as right now. And I think um, Dr. Mosler, you can back me up on this is that uh, whether or not that you're vaccinated, you can still come down with COVID and it has been proven that people even with vaccination have developed COVID 
It's not a hundred percent guarantee so that we do require that people still mask and be cautious and, and use some type of precautions. Um, so that's why we uh, feel that, you know, following the CDC guidelines is as important at, now as it was back in May 12th, which is uh, we've had a resurge in September. So from May until September, we've had a resurge. And so this is why we mandated it back then. And now we are mandating it, I think still now, but um, that's what, um, as, a, as our Board of Health has uh, instituted this policy of wearing a mask going into any public building. So um, that's what we did back in, in May. It, setting the record straight, in May, people at the senior center who had been vaccinated were not wearing masks. Yeah, no, Jane, I think you're right, because that was at the time when the governor dropped the statewide mask requirements, right, right around that time. And things were kind of, everyone thought, oh, it's, everything's great. We can go back to whatever. But if you were not vaccinated, you were required to wear a mask. Wear a mask. Yes, but that wasn't an issue at the senior center, because well, at that point, people who came to the senior center had been vaccinated, so they were not wearing masks making it much easier for people with auditory difficulties to communicate people who have senior issues about breathing, able to breathe better without wearing a mask. I can attest to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were a lot of different things that it was an advantage to the seniors to be in a protected area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and from the past conversation to the present conversation, uh, since they started testing the people with uh, the, vac the vaccinated people, I believe the state of Massachusetts is up to almost 30,000 now. I'm guessing that have found out that they are vaccinated and they do have COVID. And th this is why the mask mandate came back into place for everyone presently. So that was asymptoma asymptomatic spread. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That was discriminatory policy, I believe. That's what we were talking about. Uh, privacy and HIPAA regulation. Maintaining copies of resident or employee medical records, such as vaccine cards, um, anything along those lines. What the policy said was we weren't going to require proof of that vaccine or maintain those records because uh, at the time I said, we didn't want that responsibility as far as, you know, complying with HIPAA, you, you know, keeping copies of people's medical records. And not everybody that has access to people's records has taking the uh, HIPAA um, uh, protocol that we have to take with the state um, in doing our uh, ethics uh, commission or ethics um, um, questionnaire or whatever we do each year. So everybody that has uh, access to that is not on that um, protocol that we are. Okay. If you're so, talking about volunteers at the senior center, they have all taken the ethics training. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. No, I think she's talking about the HIPAA training as far as how to store and handle and protect. Um, mm -hmm. And I've taken that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have to take it every, uh, as a matter of fact, I just did it today with, with MG. Um, I have to do that every year. Okay. Um, public access to town property meetings or events based upon vaccine status and requesting medical documentation of vaccine status. We kind of touched on this in some of the other uh, items, but uh, one of the concerns, again, was if someone's a taxpayer in town and they want to go to some event that's being held, they want to go to a, you know, a soccer game, they want to go to something along those lines, uh, you know, they're paying taxes, how can you tell them they cannot participate based on their personal health condition? The same way you can tell someone if they have something like obvious measles, mumps, whooping cough, that you don't go in public places. 
well, you you don't go to public school. You know, childhood the vaccinations are required to go to school, public school. Wasn't there part of this conversation that was, do you require people to also get the uh, flu vaccine? Correct. Wasn't that, that was also part of the conversation? Yep, you're right. And uh, the town does not require anybody to get a flu vaccine. Um, to this day, we still don't require that as far as I know. Like we require diseases, but not viruses. It's it's not a matter of diseases versus bacterial versus a viral infection. It's um, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, you know, highly contagious diseases that have significant impact. Like on, whooping, whooping cough on yeah. on, pub, on public health. Uh, mm -hmm. Influenza virus has a different virulence, a different disease course. Um, you know, we have what, maybe 30,000 people a year usually die from, uh, uh, the flu virus. So it's, um, it's, it's in a different category, but it's not based on its, uh, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, it's, it's about its, its virulence, how sick it makes people. Mm -hmm. People die from flu just as well. They die from COVID and being, uh, well, they, uh, they do, they do Joyce, but on the average, 30,000 people a year die from influenza. Yeah. And we've already had, you know, 700,000 deaths from COVID now. Yeah. I, 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 I know the numbers are totally an extreme, but I just want to say over the years before we had gotten COVID um, or come into this COVID thing that we're dealing with right now is that people did die from flu. Um and that, you know, it was up to people whether or not they wanted to get the flu shot. I, as an employee of MGH, I am mandated to get flu and COVID. So there is no question about whether I have to, but as part of my employment, I have to do that because I'm in healthcare. Now, other people that are not in healthcare, but are in the community, they're, they're not being mandated necessarily to get COVID or flu. Um, at this time, well, well, they are in fact. Well, yeah, all state all employees. The airlines, there's federal mandates now. All the airlines. I mean, that's that's not true, Joyce. Well, I'm and talking all the about, state I'm, employees. I'm, well, I'm talking about towns. There's only one town within all of the 351 t uh, cities and towns that we uh, that the state has that only Worthington has mandated that their town employees get the COVID vaccine. No other place has mandated um, for their employees to get the vaccine. And but I feel like we're getting a little bit off topic since we're trying to revert back to May when nothing was. Yes. Um, yes. Thanks, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I just, I'm not really sure how much more conversation needs to go on because all we're going to do is just be sitting here and saying, well, since May, dot, dot, yeah. dot. Well, yeah. we're going yeah. back to May. Let's go back to May when nothing was approved. Nothing was, you know, anything. And True. what we were going by back in May was none of these, these shots are all experimental. Yeah, We don't know what's going to happen to people. We don't know who's going to die from the vaccine. We don't know if the vaccine is effective. We don't know if people that got the vaccine should have to wear masks or not wear masks or everyone wear masks like that, that back in May, that's where we were. So I think we should take a vote on back in May and then moving forward, maybe something different. But I think right now, all we're doing is wasting everybody's time. That's taking the time to be here right now. Exactly. That that's my last question in the present. How much is this complaint costing us in litigation right now? Do we have an idea of how much, Caroline? Are we four thousand, five thousand, ten thousand? You're making you know, John John, I I just like to say that um I I think the issue with this vote that was taken back in May was uh the lack of transparency to the to the the residents of Hadley, um, you know, everybody's everybody's got their opinion. People want to be heard. People want to be listened to. 
and they want some type of forum and some type of dialogue. So I don't well, know that it's well, I'm a necessarily a taxpayer, and I just asked a question, and I'd like an answer to it. Well, I, I don't know that Carolyn can give you that exact number here. Obviously, there's uh, KP Law's time, Jeff's time, as far as responding to the uh, open meeting violation complaint, um, his time for being here tonight, although he's going to be here for other items in executive anyways. But um, we are paying for his time this evening and for him or somebody on his staff to draft the uh, response letter to the AG. So there, there are costs associated with it, but um, I don't think we should put Carolyn on the spot to just have that number right now. <laughs> I don't have the exact number, but I, I, I can tell you, John, it's, it's um, closer to your 4,000 mark. All right, thanks. Can we advance this conversation at all? I, I would really like to touch back on Michelle Morris Friedman's request that there be some kind of posted public conversation to go over this in detail and not sort of satisfy the letter of the law um, with a last item and a long meeting, um, and, and, but really get somewhere with, with a conversation that invites public input. So we have a public uh, comment session every, um, every meeting that's posted. Um, Michelle and Andy were the only ones that showed up for this evening, despite this being posted and despite the newspaper covering it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we, we provide that opportunity for people to comment and make their feelings heard. Uh, we have not posted a public forum, so to speak, or a public whatever topic, uh, just as we don't post a public, uh, policy, uh, public forum for every topic that the select board votes on. Because if that was the case, then nothing would, would, would ever be done in town. Um, this is- I disagree. I disagree that that would not be effective and that nothing would be done if you permitted that level of discourse. Um, okay, but this is a select board conversation. Um, so I just ask that you be respectful and uh, let the select board have the conversation right now. Okay. The, the, the people want to be listened to, David. You know, people want to have their voice. And. Um, you know, I, I think we could work towards that. Uh, I'm more than happy to have a conversation where people, this is um, certainly has been a very difficult time right now with COVID and everything and trying to get uh, people to have conversations and everything. And I'm, I'm all about people participating in whatever conversation that we have. And, um, not having them be able to be at our meetings or whatever, um, it has not been kind of fruitful at times. Um, so maybe at some point, you know, having a different conversation. Um, right now, we're trying to rectify the AG's um, thing that he wants us to do for rectifying our meeting from May 12th. Uh, and going forward, we can actually have maybe a different conversation of what we need to do because right now this COVID ain't going away. So we need still to, to have some type of conversation on how we're going to deal with the public and um, uh, inside activities and things like that because we're coming upon winter. So, you know, kind of let's um, get through this tonight, see if we can arrange something where uh, we can have more conversation on the COVID business because it is a whole conversation that I certainly think more people and uh, us want to participate in. So uh, let's get through what we need to do to tonight and then, you know, set up something that we can do uh, more for the COVID conversation with Board of Health and, and the select board and seniors or, and whoever else wants to participate. So I hear you saying that tonight we're not doing anything except what we did in last May, but we should, it would be useful to have a future conversation about COVID and where the town stands and what its policies ought to be. That's just that what, what I said, Jane. Okay, so I move we get this on a future agenda for a current um, discussion of COVID and policies around town. I don't yep. think we can make a new motion because I think we're still stuck back in May 12th currently. 
I know so how right. we made a motion. I think I you're think we just, made a motion. We're um, just doing it. I think we're we're asking that a future meeting be held for COVID and town buildings or meetings and how we want to proceed uh, toward the future. And maybe within the next month or so, we may have a better idea of where we are at with this COVID situation and what we need to do. Agreed? Yep. We'll yeah. Do we have a motion on the floor, David? No. Okay, I make a motion we put this on a agenda in the next three meetings. Sounds like a plan. Let's just do it and get it done. If we have to take up most of the meeting for that, then let's go for let's um, get through town meeting we have a last meeting in october let's put this on one of the first agendas in november how's that sound excuse me can i just ask for clarification so we don't get into the same situation we had before if if we can work on a uh, a detailed uh agenda yeah. item for that for that yeah that would be helpful. I, I don't, I don't want i just don't want to get in this situation again no i mean like do we need to make a motion to do that now yeah, James, can I ask that you would just withdraw that until we finish up the, the rehash of the May 12th, and then we can, we, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that as soon as we do what we need for the AGs, just so we don't get uh, confused here, and that we can can talk in depth about what we need to talk about at a few, at an upcoming meeting. Is that, is that right? Okay, no problem. Withdrawn. All right, th thanks. Um, all right. Uh, requiring town employees to be vaccinated, number nine. Again, going back to um, employees, uh, I know we have most employees vaccinated. I know there are some that's not, and that's their choice or their medical reason, whatever. But um, we've, I have also had uh, several of those employees come to me and said that they will uh, no longer work here. Um, and this is back going back in May, that they, were, they would no longer work here if they were mandated to, uh, to do that. So that was one of the concerns at the time that we want people that are good at their jobs and do what they do and not, you know, being forced out over that. So that was one of the concerns at the time. Uh, Following CDC guidelines, we are not in a position at this point to mandate any public employee to be fully vaccinated. They still do have to follow CDC guidelines um, uh, in masking and doing whatever else, but I am not in a position right now that I would approve um, all town employees to be vaccinated. We're talking, we're talking May 12th. We're not talking now. I know. She's not I now and she wasn't then. I I'm talking about what I said no, back in May. Add me to that list. I, I, I am I saying back in May, in May that that's what I had said, that I don't agree with people. We infringing on people to be mandated to be vaccinated if they do not feel comfortable being vaccinated. But they still have to follow the CDC guidelines of being masking and doing whatever they need uh, to protect themselves and other people from the COVID. And I believe that's what I said even back then. John, you were you were saying something. Did Joyce cover it? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way I felt back in May. At, at this point, I, I don't want to put any more restrictions on any of our employees at all. If we're going to lose firemen and policemen. And John, back people, in May, May, May. Yes. And yeah. If Same. we're going to lose our employees because they don't want to get vaccinated, that's a pretty piss poor way to run a business, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we're not mandated right now. It's not a it's not a statewide federal thing. Okay, so Amy, then I will make a motion. Can I make a motion then? Hold on, go we, for it, Amy. Amy, we got to cover two more bullet points. So if it's a motion to keep what we have, we got to talk about them. But if it's something else, go ahead. No, no. Finish, please. I just got to hit all the, all the items here as required. Uh, 10, vaccination status and individuals holding an elected or appointed position in town. Um, at the time, the discussion was if someone's in elected office and they have not received the vaccine, 
Um, and we were to mandate they needed a vaccine to come into town hall, wouldn't that be basically canceling out their vote uh, the, or the residents uh, vote by not allowing them to conduct their, their duties or to do their job because they would no longer be able to be in those buildings. Uh, same with anybody that's appointed to committees, boards, et cetera. So that was, that was one of the topics of the conversation at the time. And 11, maintenance of medical records, such as vaccination records. And I'm by no means an expert on this. I'm sure Joyce can speak to this, but there's certain ways things have to be maintained, even if it is shot records and other information that I, we didn't want to get into at the time. Correct. Okay. That's, that's HIPAA. That's private. You don't need to share it. All right. All right. Uh, Jeff, did I, do you feel everything was, was covered sufficiently? Is there anything else that we need to do as far as that goes? Uh, I think you covered everything. And, and I guess the only thing you have to do is, is vote, mm -hmm. but I, I think we need to distinguish. I, I don't know. If, are there any more policies that you voted on since then? No, this was the last one pertaining to COVID, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Guidelines with so the is the original motion that we had back on uh, May 12th still in the minute? Can you yeah. read that? Yes. Let me pull it up. It is It's kind of long, but I'll read it. Uh, it is, number one, it is the town of Hadley's policy that the public shall not be denied access to town buildings, facilities, property, or events based upon vaccine status unless, unless otherwise required by law. Town of Hadley recognizes that medical decisions such as vaccine are personal choice and will not require town employees to be vaccinated as a condition of employment, just as we do not require flu shots or other vaccines in order to work for the town. No employee shall be denied access to any public building, facility, or property based on, upon vaccine, vaccine status. Number three, public access to government is critical and no person shall be denied access to in-person public meetings based upon their vaccine status unless required by law. Number four, town of Hadley shall not require medical documentation to be submitted to the town regarding vaccine status in order to participate in any public event, posted meeting, entry into town building or use of town property unless otherwise required by law. Number five, the town of Hadley shall not maintain copies of medical records such as vaccination records unless otherwise required by law. Vaccine status shall not have any impact on an individual holding an elected or appointed position for the town of Hadley. The town of Hadley and its employees, contractors, and elected officials shall not ask for or consider vaccine or other medical conditions when making an appointment or hiring decision unless otherwise authorized by law. Thank you for your motion, Mr. Chairman. Can I please second that? No, you got to make the motion. I was fine. Just... God damn. <laughs> can I can I do that? Can I yeah. just say so moved? Oh. So moved. Second. Uh, okay, motion by Amy. I need a second. Second. Second by John. All right. Any other discussion on repassing this? All right, Jeff, we good to take a vote on this, do you think? I think you are, yes. All right, All right, Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? No. Chungalo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, and then Jane. So you wanted, now. Jane, you wanted to talk about putting this on an upcoming meeting. I don't know if we need a motion, but I feel strongly we should put this on an upcoming meeting that doesn't have a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to put it on there uh, on the, the agenda. Um, I'll talk with Carolyn about what we have coming up the next couple of meetings after town meeting. Hopefully it'll be a little quieter than what we've had. So I'm sure we can devote some and, time. Uh, David, I would request that at, at that meeting that um, we not limit public comments to 15 minutes. Yeah. So, you know, whoever wants to speak can, you know, let people have their voice. Yeah, we can, we can, I'm sure, post it as a public forum on the topic. I guess that would be what it would have to be posted at, right? That'd be great. That sounds like a plan. And, and what is the agenda item exactly? COVID. Current. 
Kurt no, it's got to be a little bit more specific than that. Yeah. <laughs> you want to save some money, you got to be more specific than that. How about COVID-19 policies for the town? Was that more specific? It's not much no, more specific. No, it sounds like it's a, a, a vaccine status conversation. Well, I'll let Jeff come up with a good encompassing top agenda item for us that will satisfy so, the requirement. Yeah, I'm happy to work with Carolyn and, and Jennifer on that. Okay. Molly seems to have something to say. Say that again. Will like Carolyn say something? No, I, I'm fine. I, I just before we decide on this, I just need um a little bit more guidance about um are you are you requesting are is it going to be a just the vaccine a vaccine mandate? Is that what I, the agenda is going to be? I think no, it's a I vaccine. Think it I think it's a vaccine, um, how we deal with it within town-wide. Vaccine protocol for the town of Hadley. How's that? Huh? That sounds good, John. John, that's excellent. Geez, that's you're exactly awake Jeff? tonight. That a boy. <laughs> yep, <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. John does, does good work when he's been working hard all day long. Yeah. Running sewer yeah. lines on the street, Mark Maple. Right. Jeff, that's a good that's a good uh, explanation. That's adequate. I, I think so. If we looked at the AG's letter at the end there, they did say, I mean, you, you, I, I think a policy discussion regarding COVID nineteen um, vaccination policy or or just policy uh, for the town, I think it gives everybody um, in town. Uh, a heads up of what we're going to be discussing. Now, are, are we able to like limit it to just vaccine versus non-vaccine? Or I mean, because I feel like when you start talking about COVID-19, you get a lot of um, like sidebar conversations. I think, Amy, you have to take in both retrospects because there are people in town that don't want to be vaccinated. Um, and some people have had been vaccinated. They've had not a good outcome from vaccination and they don't feel like they need to do the booster. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of things uh, encompassing all of this. Um, and I think we have to be respectful of people's um, whys and why nots. No, no, I just meant like, we're not going to be talking about like masks and stuff because the mask and everything is state mandated. Like, Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. And then it, Individually, it's mandated by town to town or no, city the, to city. The mask, the mask is not state mandated. The mask is mandated by the Hadley Board of Health. And th that's what I just said, right. Susan. Yeah, no, town, right. town. But that's not something that we need to talk about since that's. Yeah, well, it was actually mandated. recommended by the CDC. So. But again, that's a good discussion for all of us to do. All right. And Carolyn, let's try to get word out to people so people, you know, know that they have this opportunity to speak up. Sounds good. That's what we try to do with every meeting. Yeah. That's I know why we have public comments every meeting. At the ma.org, click on the calendar. You can find every agenda for every board committee, everything you would. I know. I don't know why people don't utilize it more, but. And, and it's not our fault that they don't. Yeah, Jennifer yeah. frustrated. She does all that work and no one looks at it, she says. <laughs> um, it's easier to just complain, you know? And yeah. it's, it's easy, too. Before, we all had to go somewhere and dealing with work, and now you can do it from anywhere. So it makes it a heck of a lot easier. But, um, we, right. all want, we all want to just work together and, and do what's best because this thing isn't going away quick enough. Right. Okay, so I have the last, uh, actually, any announcements before executive session? Uh, we're adding a meeting on what day, to be sure, Jennifer or Carolyn? Next Wednesday? No, we are adding October 27th because, okay. yes, that'll give us time for the procurement for the Street Lights Forever Source, which is what the specific of that meeting is we, right we now. Will, uh, we will try not to have a lot of topics because. I will be on vacation, but I'll be at the meeting, but we're gonna to try to keep it a small agenda. So anything that can wait to the following select board meeting would be awesome. Okay. 
Um, any other announcements? I, I have just a couple. Um, my sad part of my always agenda is that um, Shelly Quinlan has lost her grandmother. So we send our condolences to Shelly. And Cindy Kisa lost her brother, Stan Sadowski, and we send our condolences to Cindy um, from the select board. So um, much love and appreciation to all of you with your your family. Thank you. Uh, we also have kind of a good thing here. We have uh, an Emmy Award. So we have the Anellos who moved to Hadley in the 80s. Uh, his dad owned uh, Pinocchio's and the Monkey Bar. All three children went through the Hadley schools. Lucia was the oldest. Hopkins class of 01 through the spent. Uh, she spent the last year or two at HCC to allow time for her tennis competitions. She went to Columbia University tennis team. And from there, apparently, she went on to the entertainment field and eventually found comic success and has just two to three weeks ago won two Emmys for her writing and directing the HBO comedy Hacks. So starring Gene Smart, who also won an Emmy, Emmy for the show. I loved her as Charlene in The Designing Woman years ago. So uh, much success to her and thank you for bringing a little bit extra light to Hadley. Thank you. Absolutely. I don't think we've an Emmy Award winner from town, have we? That's a yeah. Point. Imagine <laughs> that. Great, huh? <laughs> Not <right>. just sports. <laughs> Last call for announcements before we go to through the executive session stuff. Molly's got her hand up. Uh, well, we're not doing public comments and Molly was here during public comments. So we'll, we'll, she can jump on for public comments next time around. Um, all right, 10.1 executive session. The select board will enter into emergency executive session pursuant to MGL chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss litigation regarding the matter of Hieronymus Peter or Peter Hieronymus versus town of Hadley where discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the town's litigation position and the chair so declares. Um, so moved. All right. And so motion by Joyce, I need a second. Second. Second by John. And uh, as chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive session, and that I state that discussing the matter in open session will have an adverse effect on the town, and, town of Hadley, and we will not reconvene in open session. Um, so I need a roll call. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Thank you. 